If you would this morning, turn to the book of Esther, to the book of Esther chapter 3. And in specific today, we will be looking at verses 7 through 15 of Esther 3. Esther 3, 7 through 15. And as you get there, the, the scripture tells us something very important in James's letter to the church. And in James 1, verses 14 and 15, he writes, But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. So James writes, first comes desire, then comes sin, and then comes not a baby in a baby carriage, but death. And we see that reality borne out in our passage today, that desire gives birth to sin, and sin leads to death. It's a reality that we have to consider in our own lives, because despite what sin may say unto us, despite what the temptations and desires of our flesh may produce in our minds, sin is not neutral, but deadly. So today I want us to see that sin will stop at nothing to get its satisfaction, death. If you're able, please stand in honor of the reading of God's word from Esther chapter 3, starting in verse 7. In the first month, which is the month of Nisan, in the twelfth year of King Azuharius, they cast purr, that is, they cast lots, before Haman, day after day, and they cast it month after month till the twelfth month, which is the month of Adar. Then Haman said to King Azuharius, There is a certain people, scattered abroad, and dispersed among the peoples and all the provinces of your kingdom. Their laws are different from those of every other people. And they do not keep the king's laws, so that it is not to the king's profit to tolerate them. If it please the king, let it be decreed that they be destroyed, and I will pay ten thousand talents of silver into the hands of those who have charge of the king's business, that they may put it into the king's treasuries. So the king took his signet ring from his hand and gave it to Haman the Agite, the son of Hamadatha, the enemy of the Jews. And the king said to Haman, The money is given to you, the people also, to do with them as it seems good to you. Then the king's scribes are summoned on the thirteenth day of the first month, and an edict according to all that Haman commanded was written to the king's satraps and to the governors over all the provinces and to the officials of all the peoples, to every province in its own script and every people in its own language. It was written in the name of King Azuharius and sealed with the king's signet ring. Letters were sent by couriers to all the king's provinces with instructions to destroy, to kill, and to annihilate all Jews, young and old, women and children, in one day, the thirteenth day, the twelfth month, which is the month of Adar, and to plunder their goods. A copy of the document was to be issued as a decree in every province by proclamation to all the peoples to be ready for that day. The couriers went out hurriedly by order of the king, and the decree was issued in Susa the citadel. The king and Haman sat down to drink, but the city of Susa was thrown into confusion. And this is the Lord's word, and I pray that you receive it as such, and you may be seated. So by way of reminder, chapter 3 opens up with a promotion. Uh, But it is not a promotion to Mordecai, uh, the Mordecai who saved the king's life by discovering a plot against him by some of his eunuchs. No, the the promotion goes to Haman. We don't really know why the king promotes Haman, uh, but he promotes him to something like uh, second in all the land, uh, you know, second only to himself as king. And as part of that promotion, A decree is issued, a command is issued, that everybody, when they see Haman, should bow down and pay homage to him. But Mordecai refuses. Mordecai is one of God's people, the Jewish people, 
and to bow down and pay homage to Haman uh, is probably more than just a political problem. It's a religious problem. It's likely that entailed with that was some sort of worship or giving him honor, more honor than is due a man. And there is this kind of ethnic tension between Mordecai and Haman. Uh, Haman is an Agite, which is an Amalekite. And the Amalekites and the Jewish people were at war from generation to generation uh, from the very beginning, from the time they went into the promised land. Not only that, but Mordecai is even of the same lineage as King Saul. Uh, King Saul who killed Agag, the king of the Amalekites, way back in 1 Samuel 15. Uh, where, or rather, I should say, he didn't kill him directly. Samuel had to kill him because uh, King Saul disobeyed the Lord's command. But anyways, under King Saul's reign, this happened. And through the work of the other officials, maybe those who are trying to ingratiate themselves to Haman, Haman learns that Mordecai refuses to give him honor and to pay homage to him. And Haman is furious and his pride is wounded. And we see at the end of our last passage in verse 6, but he that is Haman but he disdained to lay hands on Mordecai alone. So as they had made known to him the people of Mordecai, Haman sought to destroy all the Jews, the people of Mordecai, throughout the whole kingdom of Azuharius. So Haman is so furious that his goal is not just the destruction of this one man who has affronted his pride, but indeed the whole people who represents the enemies of God. And then we come to our passage today. So let's see first a right time in verse 7, a right time. In the first month, we, uh, the passage opens, right? In the first month. So we don't really know how much time elapsed from Mordecai refusing to pay homage to Haman, Haman learning of this, and Haman determining to kill the Jewish people, to destroy the Jewish people. We don't know how much time has elapsed, but we do know that Haman waits for the first month to come around, and we'll get to why he does that in just a moment. Uh, but we are also told that this is in the 12th year of King Azuharius. Esther was made queen in the seventh year. So this has been five years since Esther has been made queen, just so we kind of understand the chronology of things. And we see that they cast her, that is, they cast lots. And we're unsure who the they of this is. Who is it that is casting the lots? Uh, probably something like astrologers or magicians, some kind of diviners, someone who can uh, divine the will of the gods. Uh, per is the Hebrew form of the Babylonian word peru, and again it means something like lot, but it can also secondarily mean something like fate, right? So, so understand that when they're casting lots, uh, it's something like casting dice, if you will, and what they're doing is they're trying to seek out what is the fate, uh, what is the God's will, and what is, uh, what, what kind of omens follow after these things. And that's the point. Why Haman does this in the first month is because often in this age, in this day, a calendar would be set in the very beginning of the year. They would cast lots and they would try and determine what would be good days of the year, and what would be bad days of the year. So they're trying to ascertain, you know, what, what days have the gods blessed and what days have the gods cursed. And so that way they could plan accordingly, right? In our own modern day, uh, you might see something like, right, special days of the year, Friday the 13th. You don't want to do anything on Friday the 13th because, right, it's a cursed day. And we just know that's going to be the case. Um, but they're, they're looking for omens and signs. They're looking to, to understand when is the kind of lucky day. And that's what Haman's looking for. What's the lucky day 
when the Jews should be annihilated. That's what he's searching for. So day after day, month after month, they cast lots and they say, you know, is it the first day of the month? No. Is it the second day of the month? No. Is it the third day of the month? No. And they do this until they come to the, the 13th day of the 12th month. And again, part of the, the cultural practice behind this is if they ascertain what is the lucky day, that means that the gods have to bless whatever activity is happening on that day. They, they use this casting of lots as an attempt to control the gods. And what are we to think of this practice? Well, let me just go ahead and tell you, there is no chance. There is no such thing as chance. There is no controlling the Lord God. Indeed, what does the scripture say? Proverbs 16.33, Proverbs 16.33, the law is cast into the lap, but it's every decision is from the Lord. And we may have heard uh, maybe a more modern retelling of that uh, from Albert Einstein. God does not play dice. Right? God does not leave things up to chance. There is instead the sovereign Lord who reigns over all things. God is sovereign and reigns over all things. What he has decreed from the very beginning is what will be. The scriptures again tell us in Isaiah 46, verses 9 and 10. Isaiah 46, 9 and 10. Remember the former things of old, for I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times things not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand, I will accomplish all my purpose. And by the way, Isaiah goes on to record that part of God's purpose is calling uh, the kings of the east to come and destroy his people. Right? What God has decreed, God will see that it happens every single time. So are we to be casting lots today? Are we to roll the dice and see what we should do in a day? No, I don't think that's what we should take from understanding who God is. God gives us wisdom and we should seek God's guidance, right? God has given us his word so we don't have to take things by chance. And I know that there are sometimes complex situations in our day, but there are principles in the scriptures that will help guide us. We should seek God's guidance in all things, or as uh, again, James 4.15 tells us, James 4.15, instead you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. That should be the attitude of our hearts. And I know sometimes we say that, right? Well, I'll see you if the Lord wills. And sometimes we add on the joke to the end of that, right? And the creek don't rise. But let us not make that phrase a joke unto us. When we say, if the Lord wills, we ought mean that. If the Lord wills, if it is in the Lord's sovereign plan, we should not be flippant with the use of the name of the Lord. We entrust ourselves to God and his plan. And we may say, brothers and sisters, we may say, God, I don't know what you are doing in this circumstance. I don't know how you are moving in this situation, but I entrust myself fully to your care because I know that you are good. I know that you care for me. Right? That's part of the reason uh, Peter tells us to cast all our anxieties upon God. Why? Because he cares for us. So we make known to him our anxieties. We make known to him our situations and circumstances. And we understand and acknowledge this. The circumstance that we are in today is not by chance, but by the divine providence of our Lord God. 
And by the way, that's challenging at times, isn't it? That's challenging to believe. That's challenging to acknowledge. Because sometimes we're in bad circumstances. Sometimes we walk through the valley of the shadow of death. But even as David continues there, right? But I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Whatever circumstance, whatever situation. Or as we read in Deuteronomy 31 today, be strong and courageous, for I am with you. That's the truth for God's people. So we have a right time. Let's see next, a destructive plan in verses 8 and 9. A destructive plan. So Haman approaches King Azuharius, King Xerxes, and he makes known to him his plan, but with some really important missing details. And that's intentional on Haman's part. And the king seeks no further information. Look at this. He's, Haman, Haman says to the king, well, there's a certain people scattered abroad. They're dispersed through your kingdom. This is after, by the way, some of the Jewish people have made, it, made their way back to Jerusalem. Some are there in Jerusalem, have returned from exile. But there's also a lot of people who have not returned from exile. So they are dispersed throughout the kingdom. Although certainly this is probably a bit of an exaggeration on Haman's part. It makes it seem like there are spies on every corner of every street and of every city in, in the kingdom. And that's just not the case. But the Jews are still throughout the kingdom of Azuharius, outside of the promised land. And he says their laws are different. And the reality is that's true, isn't it? That's a true statement by Haman. That their laws are different because they're God's people. God's people have always had distinct laws. And this should be true of us today, by the way. Wherever we find ourselves as Christians... Wherever we are located, if we believe in Christ, here's the one thing that should be certain about us. Our laws, the commands we follow, are different than the laws of the land in which we live. We should be a distinct people. Consider, for instance, in Acts 16, Acts 16, verses 19 through 21, Acts 16, 19 through 21. And kind of the background to this is um, Paul is on his missionary journey and he comes to uh, a city and he's there uh, ministering. And as he is doing this, as him and his company are out there ministering, preaching the gospel, there's a, a girl who is possessed by a spirit, uh, a divining spirit. Uh, so she would make her master's money by fortune telling, essentially. And she's walking around following Paul and company, shouting out, these men are of the most high God, you should listen to them. She creates a ruckus, creates a distraction, creates, uh, you know, just this, Noise always following after Paul. And in Acts 16, verses uh, 19 through 21, uh, so Paul commands the spirit to leave. That's verse 18. And the spirit left. And then verse 19. But when her owners saw that their hope of gain was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace before the rulers. When they had brought them to the magistrates, they said, These men are Jews, and they are disturbing our city. They advocate customs that are not lawful for us as Romans to accept or practice. Now, that certainly wasn't the whole truth, but in part they are right. right? Paul and Silas are advocating for customs that the average uh, Roman would probably have found repugnant because it confronted their sin. Uh, and indeed, in some sense, in this day, the early church 
uh, was called, the people of the early church were called atheists because they believed only in one God when the Romans believed in a multitude of gods. Uh, there's also uh, stories of occasions uh, where because the early church uh, called each other, right, brother or sister, that there was uh, this kind of thought by the culture at this time that the early church was practicing incest because they were marrying their brothers and sisters, right? And it's ridiculous, but again, the laws that the church follow, the customs of the church are different than the culture that, that surrounds them. And that should be true for us today. Brothers and sisters, as we are in America here, and we may identify ourselves as Americans, and we may uh, agree with a large portion of the laws of this land, but understand that there are still unjust and unrighteous laws in this land. And just because something is proclaimed forth from the halls of Congress does not make it something that we as Christians ought embrace. We ought be different and distinct even today. We are a strange people with strange laws. For instance, where others are taught to hate and in their hatred to kill, to seek to belittle, demean, destroy, we are called to love even our enemies. That's a strange law. Where others uh, speak only half-truths or outright lies and are comfortable with that. Brothers and sisters, we have a law that says we speak the truth always. Yes, we speak the truth in love, but we speak the truth. Where others act in accord with the dictates of their imaginations, of their emotions, of their own reasoning, we act in accord with the designs of God. We have strange laws. So, argues Haman, that these are people, they're dispersed throughout the kingdom, and they have strange laws. Their laws are different. But more than that, he says, and they do not keep the king's law. Now, this was untrue. By and large, right? This is more a half-truth than anything else. Because there was one law that one person, at least, would not keep. And that is paying homage, worshiping. Haman, right? Mordecai did not keep this one law, but we shouldn't think of the Jewish people as going out there breaking all these different laws, just as we today, right? We may have strange laws, but that doesn't mean we have the right or we take the right to break every law that is of our land. And notice here that Haman is really speaking deceptively because he says, right, that there, there's this people, there's a certain people. He doesn't say which people. They have strange laws, but he doesn't describe, well, how are their laws strange? He says they don't keep the king's law, but he doesn't say which of the king's law. <coughs> He's not telling the whole truth. And indeed, the way he's speaking, he wants the king to come to a foregone conclusion. And by the way, ask no further details. Haman's like, you just have to trust me on this, king. And he goes on, he says at the end of verse 8 right there, right, that it is not to the king's profit to tolerate them. King, you will gain nothing by leaving them be. And indeed, they're a revenue sucker. Right? They cost you money, king. It's not to your profit. To let them live. Something must be done about them. And again, here we have nothing from Haman saying, it's actually this one guy who's just really angered me, and that's why I want this to happen. No, he says, 
King, it's not about me, King. It's about you. It's about your prophet. It's about your kingdom. Mordecai, who's that? And it's kind of reminiscent of the language we find in chapter 1 where the king's advisor, the king's official, Memukin, says to the king, you can't let what Queen Vashti go unpunished because if you do, the whole of society, the whole of the Medo-Persian Empire society is going to come to an end because every wife is going to have contempt for her husband. The whole of society is going to dissolve if you do nothing, King Azuharius. And doesn't that sound similar to this now, right? The whole of society is coming to an end because these people, the certain people, exist in your kingdom. It's not to your profit. And then Haman goes on to say, but I will tell you what is to your profit. I'll pay 10,000 talents into the royal treasury if it please the king. And by the way, that word please there can also be translated good if it is good to the king. Let it be dis- decreed that they be destroyed. If it is good, king, let, these, let, let this genocide happen. And what do we know about such decrees? Esther one nineteen, by way of reminder. If it please the king, let a royal order go out from him and let it be written among the laws of the Persian and the Medes so that it may not be repealed. Now Vashti is never again to come before King Azuharius. Let the king give her royal position to another who is better than she. King issue such an edict for the destruction of the Jews. And I will pay. What do you call paying someone to do something that you want when they may not be inclined to do it if you didn't otherwise pay them? A bribe. Right? Haman is bribing the king. And he's bribing with a very substantial sum, 10,000 talents. You may have a footnote uh, in your Bible. The ESV does a, a talent was about 75 pounds or 34 kilograms. This is a vast sum of money translating it uh, at today's kind of silver exchange rate would be about 327 million dollars to translate it into the time period herodotus the greek historian writes something like that the empire's annual income so that the kingdom's annual income was something like 14,500 talents. So what Haman is promising is something like two-thirds of the annual income of the entire empire. So again, to give us a little bit of perspective today, the United States GDP was about $27.36 trillion last year. So $27 trillion. Two-thirds of that would be about $18 trillion. Could you imagine someone approaching the president and say, President, there's a certain people in the land in the United States of America, and they're evil, they have different laws, that it's not to your profit to to let them continue, and here's how I'm going to secure it. I'm going to pay into the United States Treasury coffers eighteen trillion dollars for the destruction of this people. What do you think the president would answer? Are you going to wire us the funds or is it going to be a cashier's check? Right? That, that would probably be the answer. You can see how compelling it would be. By the way, this is a king, remember, that has already suffered. He had a failed campaign to conquer Greece. He spent a lot of money. By the way, we know this is a king that loves to lavish. And so money into the treasury is probably a rare thing. Where was Haman getting this money? 
this giant sum of money. In some part, he probably was very wealthy. By the way, you don't become right second in command of the whole kingdom without having some wealth uh, already and without gaining some wealth. But verse 13 of the chapter also tells us at the end of verse 13 to plunder their goods. So part of what Haman is promising to the king is, let me destroy them and I'll make sure 10,000 talents get in, gets into the royal treasury. And by the way, part of the way we're going to do that is by confiscating the destroyed Jews' goods. We're going to confiscate their houses. We're going to confiscate their jewelry. We're going to confiscate everything that they have and we're going to pay it into the treasury. And then you can go buck wild king. You could do whatever you want with it. It'll be yours. By the way, that tactic is used throughout history in countries and has been used against the Jews before, too. And this is really chilling, isn't it? What hatred, what seething rage exists inside of this man. And he is second in all the kingdom. The king has promoted him above all the other officials. And what lengths he is going to to destroy his enemies. So it's the king to say, well, let's see next a rubber stamp in verses 10 and 11. A rubber stamp. So the king took his signet ring. He asked for no further details. There's no discussion here. There's no, there's no asking, okay, well, what are the consequences of this? Like, do you have a flow chart of who is uh, of this certain people who are in the command structures throughout the kingdom? I mean, do we have governors that are of this people that we're going to have to replace? He asks for no details, and instead all he does is he takes his signet ring, the, the sign of his authority, and gives it to Haman to do whatever seems good to him. And we are told, we are reminded again of the name of Haman, that he is the Agite, the son of Hamadatha, the enemy of the Jews. He is the enemy of of the Jews. The king asks no questions. He doesn't ask for other officials' advice. He doesn't, for instance, investigate. I wonder where my wife, what ethnicity she is. Nothing. He thinks this people, because he is made to think this people, are distant from him. But in reality, they share his bed. But if we add some question about who Haman is in relation to God's people, it's here spelled out, right, that he is the enemy of the Jews. And we should not be surprised in our own day when people hate God's people solely for being God's people. The same is true today. There are people who hate Christians solely because they identify themselves with Christ. And they follow in the stead, right after the likeness of the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in them, the sons of disobedience. And we must remember that even in this, right, though the author does not pull this out for us to see, but we have to understand that there are dark spiritual forces always at work to destroy God's people. Ephesians 6.12 Ephesians 6.12 For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. That's the reality. What is motivating Haman is some of that same 
evil spirit that in the very beginning said, did God really say? And the king does make a reply to Haman other than just giving him the authority. The king says to him, the money is given to you, the people also, to do with them as it seems good to you. The money is given to you. Uh, that's kind of a difficult phrase if you just read that there. Um, in the New English translation, the NET Bible uh, actually translates it, keep your money. Uh, likely the king still expects to get paid. And I think that bears out both in chapter 4, verse 7, the way that Mordecai describes the money, the exact sum of money being paid into the treasury. And also in uh, chapter 7, verse 4, when Esther describes what is happening to the king, it seems exactly like, you know, my people are, are being sold for destruction. So there's actually a, a transfer of money. Um, one suggestion for understanding this phrase is saying something like that the king uh, is saying to Haman that the plunder of the Jews is his to do with as he sees fit. All right, so the king is giving Haman authority to enact his plans. He's giving him authority to take and kill the people. He's giving him authority to take and plunder their goods. And then Haman's going to take those plundered goods and pay it into the treasury because that's the only way he can meet the, the full sum of what he has promised. Again, this is chilling because whatever else we may think of King Xerxes, of King Azaharius here, we should at least think of this. He doesn't care about human rights. Or he has no care about human rights. There is no Bill of Rights. There is no Constitution, right, in the kingdom of Azuharius. There is only the king, and what the king says goes, no matter what. No matter if the king's decree is, go and take all the beautiful young virgins from all throughout the land and bring them to my place, that I may have them and use them as I will. Or go send a command to destroy all these people, because it's, of the whim of my top official to do so. He is willing to extinguish a whole people based on the advice of one of his counselors, advice that if he had sought further and inquired further, he would find out that it is personally motivated. It's not about the king's prophet. It's about Haman's prophet. This king seeks no wisdom. And instead he says to Haman, do what seems good to you. And again, that word good could mean please. Do what pleases you, Haman. Do what is good. And isn't that what is exactly what's absent in this situation? The king is not good. Haman is not doing good. They're doing evil. So we've seen a right time, a destructive plan, a rubber stamp. Now let's finish with a royal edict. A royal edict in verses 12 through 15. Then the king's scribes were summoned. Right, The edict is going to be issued. It's written to everyone in their own language just in the same manner that uh, the order was issued against Vashti. And this edict was summoned on the first, uh, the scribes were summoned on the 13th day of the first month. So again, put that chronology in, in mind. We don't know how long Haman had to come up to his plan, but as soon as the first month came, he sought out the astrologers, the diviners, the magicians, the magi, right? to ascertain what is the lucky day, the will of the gods. And between that time and the 13th day, Haman has this conversation with the king and he moves immediately to let the edict be issued throughout the land. Haman wastes no time. He's in the first month. The day isn't until the 12th month. 
but he's not going to dilly dally. And remember too that this is a a large kingdom. It ranges from where modern day Pakistan is to uh, modern day northern Sudan or, or southern Egypt. It's a vast land. Uh, there is no Twitter that he can just fire out a tweet and say, everyone get ready to kill the Jews. Right? There is no telephone service. There's no telegraph. If you want to go old timey, but not old timey enough, what is there, right? There's couriers. They send it out in the mail. And these couriers go and take the message. Now, what we may not understand about this, the significance of this day in which the order is drafted to be issued is this. The first day or the 14th day of the first month is celebration of Passover. So think about this. The people in Susa, as they're preparing to celebrate Passover, God's deliverance of his people from Egypt, hear this. They are to be destroyed, to be annihilated, to be killed. What do you think that Passover would have been like? They may have been asking the question, God, will you rescue your people again? Or is this the last Passover that will ever be celebrated by any of your people? Because we're set aside for destruction. Surely the Jewish people would have understood the significance of what is transpiring in the Persian kingdom. So the edict goes out on the day before Passover, and it's written in the name of the king. Right? This is Haman's command, Haman's desire, but he has the king's authority. He has the king's signet ring. And remember that this is a law that once made cannot be revoked, cannot be repealed. And letters were sent, and see this in verse 13, right? The instruction was to destroy, to kill, and to annihilate all Jews, right? That's legal language. If you've ever read a legal document, you often find that they use five words when one su would suffice. But that's because they use five words because they're synonyms and they're close, but they may have different shades of it. So that way, if there's, there's no understanding, if all five words are there, there's no understanding, right? There's no misunderstanding there about what is to transpire. And so to here, right? They're to be destroyed. If you don't know what it means to be destroyed, kill. If you don't know what it means to kill, annihilate. Whatever word works, works. And the promise is that you will get to plunder their goods. So kill the young, kill the old, kill the men, kill the women, kill the children. In one day, go forth, slay your neighbors, slay those whom you work for, slay those who work for you. Wherever they may be found, kill them and take their goods on order of the crown. And a copy of the document was to be issued as a decree in every province by proclamation to all the peoples to be ready for that day. Part of the reason for Haman's urgency, right, is it's going to take time to disperse throughout the kingdom, but he's also saying to them, get ready, sharpen your swords, sharpen your daggers, make plans, get together with the, the other people in your community and, and plan on how you're going to destroy the Jews. And the couriers went out hurriedly by order of the king. And the decree was issued. And it was issued first, obviously, in Susa. That's the capital, right, that where the king is at. 
where Haman's at. It's going to get there first. The, the notice is posted. The communication goes, goes forth. And what is the result? The end of verse 15 tells us the city of Susa was thrown into confusion. But notice, too, the contrast here. While the rest of the city is perplexed, doesn't know what's going on, why is this happening? And think about what that, what that probably looked like, right? There were some who probably hated the Jewish people, and they were celebrating. They were joyful. They were out in the streets partying. There were the Jews who were, uh, you know, mourning, putting on sackcloth and ashes, crying out to God. And then there were the other people who were neither enemy nor Jew, who were probably just like, what happened? Like, what, what is going on? What, what did these people do that the king feels so strongly that they should be destroyed? And maybe in the back of their, their minds were also, you know, well, I'm from a minority culture. Is the king going to issue a decree to say that we should be destroyed too? Like, what's, I thought this king was like accepting of other religions and of other peoples, and yet here he is, Working, our, working their destruction. Am I going to be destroyed? Am I going to be caught up in this? And note the contrast. Where are the king and Haman? It doesn't say that they're having a feast, but it sure sounds like a celebration, right? They were sitting down to drink. So just picture that scene for a moment. In the palace, the king and Haman... They're reclining back. They're drinking wine. They're talking shop. Oh, I heard it's going to be a warm one this week. Oh, I heard that it was supposed to rain. The astrologers cast lots and they said it's going to be rain all week long. They're sitting back and drinking while the rest of the city, the rest of the capital is thrown into confusion and perplex perplexity right there. They don't know what's happening. There's mourning, there's joyous celebrations. What is going on? King and Haman are at peace drinking wine. The rest of the people unhinged. And what's motivating Haman? Why does Haman carry this out? He has a desire to be worshipped. He has a desire to have his pride bolstered at every occasion. That desire gives birth to sin. Mordecai hasn't given me the honor that I want, and it gives birth to death. And in this case, Haman thinks that his desire will give birth to the death of the Jews, his enemies, but in reality, the only thing that Haman's sinful desire is working out is his own death. God is just. Vengeance is mine, says the Lord. I will repay. But God's people are to be different. And we see this in no small part in Romans chapter 6. And I'll draw our attention there as we close today. Romans 6. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may, may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried therefore with him by baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. For if we've been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died has been set free from sin. Brothers and sisters, if you are in Christ, you are dead to sin. Sin is no longer your master. 
You are no longer enslaved to sin. You are instead resurrected to a new Christ-like life. Ephesians 2 tells us, right, that we have been made alive together with Christ. And yet, as that is true, there is still work to be done in our war against sin. And we must, by the Spirit, put to death the deeds of the body. That's Romans 8. We have to confess, as James writes, that, the, that our own desire, our own fleshly desire, is what gives birth to sin in our life. It's not to discount that there, are, there is an evil one who seeks to tempt us to sin. But part of what James is doing is setting aside the excuse that God has led us to this point to make us sin. No, we sin because we desire it. And we have to know that sin leads to death. Sin never leads us to good pastures and to still waters. Sin promises us good. Right? Sin says you will have what is pleasing to you. You will have what you desire. That's what it spoke to Haman. Haman, if you would just carry out this plan to destroy the Jewish people, you will have what you have always desired. You will have the honor that you should always have. People will worship you. Haman, people will worship you if you destroy these people with their strange laws that say there is only one who should be worshipped, the Lord God and him only. But we should know that sin promises what is pleasing to us, but it only delivers poison, that which affects our death. And we have to confess that sometimes what is pleasing to us is evil. That is just evil. We cannot trust every desire of our hearts, even if we are in Christ, because our flesh wages war against our spirit, against God's spirit in us. And friend, you may believe that your every thought and desire is good, but you have to recognize that it's not true. Haman probably thought, this is good. What I'm doing is good. We see that in the language between him and the king. Right? If it is good to you, king, you should do this. And the king, if, it, if it's good to you, do whatever you want with this people and with their plunder. But you must recognize that not every thought and desire that you have is good. That's not true. You must recognize that sin will stop at nothing to have what it wants from you, your very life. And if you fail to turn to Christ, that is exactly what you will have, death. Your sin, everything that you think and say and do that is not in accord with God's commands, condemns you before the holy God. And your sin may please you, but it will result in your death. But Christ Jesus died on the cross for his people's sins. He bore God's wrath. And if you trust in him and in his work, if you confess the truth of your sin before God, you will be forgiven for your sin. And you will join in the death and the resurrection of Christ. But I read out of Romans 6. So believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Turn from your sin and give God the glory. Let's pray. O oh, great Father in heaven, we pray that you would forgive us of our sins. Father God, we pray that we may not adopt the spirit, the demeanor, the attitude, 
the plans and the purposes of even this evil one, Haman, who is the enemy of your people, the Jewish people. Father God, we pray that you would save us from such sinful hatred as is common in this world around us. Father God, we pray that you would indeed give us that new heart and a new spirit, that you would renew our minds and that we would adopt even those laws which make us strange to the people around us. Father God, we pray that once where there was hatred, that there would be love even for our enemies. Father God, that we would seek to do good to all, even those who persecute us and harass us. Father God, we pray that you would give us strength of mind and heart and spirit and soul, that we would love you as we ought and love one another as we ought. Father God, we pray for your spirit to this end. We pray for your spirit upon us who believe in Christ, but also for those who are in our hearing that do not believe in Jesus, who have not submitted to him as Lord. Father, even now, by your spirit, regenerate them. Change their hearts. that They may see they may hear and they may believe and confess Jesus is Lord even as we who believe confess Jesus you are our Lord and it is in his name that we pray amen <laughs>